as an entrepreneur, it was about, well, if I work harder, if I, you know, say positive affirmations, if I don't sleep and I go beast mode, I can fix it. I can turn it around. And going through that process, I realized those things don't work. I don't mind making mistakes because everyone does and it's how you learn and it's how you get better. Um, but it, you know, it is disheartening to have people blatantly refer to you as stupid, um, you know, to say that, you know, well, she never had any control anyway. Oh, well, you know, they charge too much for their products. So that's why their stores close good for them. Carol's daughter, the brand that is well known within the natural hair community. Carol's daughter started off strong, becoming a beloved brand for many women in the kinky coily hair community. Unfortunately, Carol's daughter's elite status wouldn't last forever. Seemingly overnight, Carol's daughter became one of the most hated natural hair brands in the USA. So how did this happen? How did a brand that even celebrities like Oprah endorsed fall so far from grace? Well, we'll find out today on Dynamic Touch. Lisa Price was born on May 18th 1962 to two loving parents in Brooklyn, New York. Growing up, Price developed a very strong love of fragrance. One of her earliest memories was her grandmother Chanel No. 5. Young Lisa Price never understood why her grandmother would only wear the perfume on Sundays when she was going to church. She would often question her grandma about the bottle, mesmerized by its beauty. This love of fragrance would last a lifetime, inspiring Lisa to eventually create her own fragrances and scents as well. In 1990, Lisa began to make creams and lotions in her kitchen. The reason why she began to create lotions and creams in her kitchen was because she realized that fragrances would last longer when they were layered with body products such as shower gels and lotions of the same scent. Price stuck to natural ingredients due to the fact that her products were homemade. Little did she know that years later, this would be an asset to one of her future businesses. Price began to give out her creations as gifts to family and friends for the holidays or for birthdays. Her products were so good that in 1993, her family encouraged her to begin to sell her creations. What specifically marked the beginning of her business was when her mother, Carol, encouraged her to sell at their local church's flea market. Price took a leap of faith, invested 100 US dollars, and set up shop at the local flea market with only a couple dozen jars of the creams that she had formulated. Much to her surprise, she sold out completely. From there, someone invited her or handed her a flyer for a craft fair. This craft fair was happening in a couple of weeks and Mrs. Price was ready for the challenge. She went on to spend the summer of 93 selling at multiple craft fairs, multiple flea markets, and micro expos in the Brooklyn area. And thus, her business was born. In August of 1994, Price officially established Carol's Daughter. As her business grew, Carol's Daughter did face some uncertainties. In an interview with Naturally Curly, Lisa Price expressed some early concerns she had with her business. Concerns with attracting new customers and being able to pay her employees were always at the back of her mind. Lisa Price used her and her husband's connections in television production to help push her product to the forefront. Asking friends who were makeup artists and hairstylists in the industry to try out their products. These friends in turn introduced the products to their clients. This helped the products made at Carol's Daughter land into the hands of some prominent people, which includes Will and Jada Pinkett Smith. At the same time, everyday women, especially black women, were becoming hooked to the brand. By 1999, Price saw herself adding mail order services and an online website to the Carol's Daughter brand. Her business also moved from the parlor floor of her brownstone to a formal store in Brooklyn's upscale Fort Greene area. Carol's Daughter began to garner even more celebrity attention. Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith, Halle Berry, Shaka Khan were just some of the high profile names ordering face, hair, body, and home products from Carol's daughter. Little did Price know that one of the most influential women of that time was also a Carol's daughter diehard fan, and that this fan would change the trajectory of her brand forever. During this time, there was something called the Oprah effect. What is the Oprah effect? 
Basically, the Oprah effect was how quickly a business was able to see growth after being mentioned on The Oprah Show or in O Magazine. On June 26, 2022, the brand Carol's Daughter would experience the Oprah effect after being featured on the show that afternoon. Within minutes of being featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show, Carol's Daughter online customers climbed from just 17 people to thousands. That same year, Carol's daughter will go on to earn a whopping $2.25 million. Being on the Oprah Winfrey show also resulted in something that was very unexpected for the brand. It attracted the attention of a man by the name of Steve Stout. Stout was a music industry executive at Sony Music in Interscope Giffen AM. He produced albums for Mariah Carey and Nas, led the production efforts for Gwen Stefani and Enrique Iglesias, and executive produced the Academy Award winning 8 Mile film and soundtrack. At that time, Carol's Daughter was everywhere. It was on the news, it was in magazines, it had tons of buzz around the brand and its products. Stout saw this and he wanted in. He made a request to a mutual friend to set up a business meeting with Mrs. Price. Much to his dismay, the brand was not exactly what he had hoped for. Keep in mind at this time, Carol's daughter was run 100% with Lisa Price and her husband. They were not the business savvy individuals that you would see working behind these brands and pushing these brands of that time. Stout could see the potential growth that Carol's daughter could reach and wanted to take the company to the next level concerning sales and expansion. Carol's daughter had the clout. They just needed to expand and that is exactly what Stout planned to help the business do. Stout and Price decided to team up and help to grow Carol's daughter together. At this time, Carol's daughter needed money to help the company reach its expected projective growth. Stout used his connections to bring in strategic investors. He wanted investors who would both invest financially in the business as well as endorse the brand. Thus, he began to reach out to celebrities who were already fans of the brand, Will and Jada Pinkett Smith. Will and Jada had been using the brand since 1997 or 1998. So of course, when this investment opportunity landed in their lap, they took the opportunity in 2005. Next came Jay-Z. It turns out Beyonce was also using products from Carol's daughter. And lastly, Mary J. Blige. Together, these celebrities raised about $10 million in investment capital. In an interview with CNBC, Stout mentioned that these celebrities were not only investors, but they also owned portions of Carol's daughter. Stating, and I quote, I wanted to get strategic investors, people who could not only bring money to capitalize the growth of the company, but also were strategic in saying, you know what? You should use Carol's daughter. It works. And initially, I went right to the people who were actually using the product. So it was Jada and Will who were my first investors. And then I went to my very good friend, Jay-Z. Beyonce was using the product. And later we got another good friend of mine, Miss Mary J. Blige, to come on as a spokesperson, as well as one of the owners of the company. In fall of 2005, Carol's daughter opened up a flagship store on 125th Street in Harlem. A flagship store is a retailer's primary location. While many consider it to be a store's first retail store, retailers often reserve this title for stores that they consider to be the most notable. A flagship store could typically be the largest store in a retailer's chain, the retailer's most popular or busiest location, the store with the most inventory, the store with the highest priced items, the store that sells the most merchandise, compared to other stores in the chain, the most unique or experimental store in the chain, the store with the best design execution and attention to detail, the store that best embodies the retailer's brand. This store would be the brand's second and most important one. The brand pulled out all the stops for this store. Carol's daughter next goal was to take on the beauty world. Outside of its cult and celebrity following, a lot of consumers were not aware of Carol's daughter as a brand. So maybe they have heard the brand in passing, but they don't know too much about the brand and what the brand had to offer. Carol's daughter new goal was to introduce the brand to new consumers. This in turn would lead to major growth and new customers. 
The brand made major strides towards its goals of expansion when it landed Sephora in 2006. Having your product in Sephora is a major milestone because it helps to further solidify brands as high-end brands. This would also be the brand's first distribution channels, outside of channels they built for themselves. Next, Carol's daughter was able to get into Macy's department store in late 2006, early 2007. Then came Dillard's, HSN, and Ulta. Everything was going well. The brand was finally able to enter the prestige hair care space. And many new customers were being introduced to the brand. They even had a counter at Macy's. The company was growing at a very fast rate, and it was projected to grow even faster. In December of 2007, Carol's daughter took on equity investment from Pegasus Capital Advisors and was especially used to create products for mass distribution. In early 2008, Carol's daughter began to push forward with their holiday plans. Unbeknownst to them, a major event was about to take place, and this event would shake the foundations of the company. We took on equity investment in December of 2007 with Pegasus Capital Advisors. What we didn't know, none of us knew, was that a recession was coming. Our retailers were super excited that we had this investment. We had commitments from them for a holiday 2008 and you ship holiday uh, in two installments. There's an installment that goes out in August and an installment that goes out in November. And because of what occurred within the economy towards the end of 2008, no one shopped for holiday the way any of us thought they would. And that second shipment actually never left our warehouse. So when we entered 2009, there was a lot of surplus inventory and we are a little over a year into our you know, investment and the growth plan is already off. Now it's 2009 and Carol's daughter is stuck with the unbelievably hard task of selling inventory that was supposed to be sold in late 2008. And this amount of inventory isn't just a small amount of inventory, it's hundreds and thousands of inventory that was supposed to be sold during the holiday season. At the same time, the company was also battling declining sales in stores. Like many other businesses of the time, for the next couple of years, Carol's daughter would struggle with sharp declines in stores because consumers were making the shift to online shopping. So what happened with us, we were seeing a decline in our stores for years, for the past four years. And initially I thought, and some of my team members thought that it was because we didn't have the bandwidth to really give attention to the retail stores. And for me, I was overwhelmed with figuring out department stores and figuring out HSN. And when we got those things figured out and had them under control, you know, we were able to say, okay, let's really look at the merchandising in the stores. Let's look at the staff in the stores. Let's look at the size of the stores. What are we doing that's um, apparently not working and how can we fix it? We redesigned, we opened up a salon in our Harlem store, which is still doing well. We opened up one in our Atlanta store, which unfortunately did not do well. We changed the merchandising. We changed how people navigate within the store and it didn't really help. And the reason that I think that it didn't help is because people shop very differently today. This decline would continue on for years. Finally, in 2011, there was reports and rumors of Carol's daughter filing for a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The company went on to close five of its 11 storefronts. In 2014, the owners of Carol's Daughter made the major decision to sell the brand for an undisclosed amount of money to French-owned L'Oreal. On October 20th, 2014, L'Oreal USA announced via a statement that they had finalized an agreement to acquire Carol's Daughter. In the announcement, the company stated, Carol's Daughter possesses an expertise in the multicultural consumer segment a rapidly expanding market that represents an important growth opportunity in the beauty industry. Frederick Rosé, 
President and CEO of L'Oreal USA said in a statement, this acquisition will enable L'Oreal USA to build a new dedicated multicultural beauty division as part of our consumer products business and strengthen the company's position in this dynamic market. Carol's daughter will continue to operate out of their New York City headquarters under the brand's current leadership team, the statement indicated. The brand joined L'Oreal's roster of American brands, which included Maybelline New York, Kiehl's, Essie, Urban Decay, Clarisonic, and NYX. At this time, the move made sense financially for the company, but unfortunately it set off a flurry of backlash across social media. In a world where successful black owned businesses were few and far in between, a lot of black people in the United States were so proud that a black owned business could be successful and most importantly, own 100% of their company. A lot of the cult consumers that helped the business initially grow expressed their disappointment in fear that the products they had come to love would not be the same after selling it to a bigger business. Many people took to Twitter to express their feelings, stating things like, Lisa Price is a sellout, and this is the reason why black people can never have anything good. At the same time, Lisa Price was incredibly stunned and confused about the backlash. She would still be very much a part of the Carol's Daughter brand, just not in the ownership position. This event set a new precedent to how the community and how the consumers of black owned products would react anytime going forward, other black businesses sold their brands to big business. As of late, Honeypot, a black owned feminine hygiene brand has been facing major backlash due to changes in their formulation and with their ingredients, as well as rumors that they are selling their business to a bigger corporation. Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok were lit with discussions about another betrayal. They're doing the same thing they did with Carol's Daughter and Shea Moisture, a lot of people expressed. A lot of black people, especially black people in the United States, support black businesses in the hopes that black business will become super successful and be able to pass on generational wealth. They want to see a black owned brand become mainstream and succeed. And then they want to additionally see that brand being passed on to the children of the brand owners creating generational wealth. This is done in an effort to make generational wealth a common thing within black communities in the USA. For a quick example, let's look at several businesses that can become successful and also create opportunities through acquiring wealth or going from a lower income tax bracket to a middle class tax bracket. For generations, beauty supply stores have been self-sufficient businesses that make between 100 to 400,000 US dollars yearly. This allows for beauty supply store owners to pass on wealth to their families as well as the family business. Hair corporations that specialize in making synthetic hair wigs make about 500,000 to 2 million dollars yearly selling synthetic wigs to mostly black women. This is also why this industry is so protected and it's also very hard for black women to crack into the synthetic hair industry. Laundry mat owners make anywhere between 50,000 to 500,000 yearly and can pass on their business. Gas station owners make between 40,000 and $100,000 a year and can also pass on their business. It is not unreasonable to see why black people, specifically black people in America, would want to have a business that also gave them the ability to pass on wealth or pass on something to their children, or at the very least experience these things vicariously through a successful black owned business. At the same time, what if a successful black owned business wants to move on to different ventures? Or if their children want nothing to do with the business when the owner of the business decides to retire. What happens when running a business isn't the true passion of the person who owns a business and they would rather take a creative stance or take a creative job than to crunch numbers? What happens when a black owned business is facing financial issues 
and wants to sell their company in order to pay off their investors and in loans and debts as well as still have a little bit of money left over to retire comfortably. It's very interesting to me that when a black owned business owner wants to graduate from their business for whatever reason, they face tons of backlash. Can we create a space within black owned businesses where businesses are allowed to sell their business for profit? Is this a thing that can actually happen without the brand experiencing major backlash? Comment down below what you guys think about this topic. I would love to hear your own opinions on the selling of a business and a business owner choosing to graduate from their business. So where is Carol's daughter today? Let's take a look at the brand. Carol's daughter can still be found online. Everything has pretty much been left the same. The website, packaging, formulations, etc., has continued to be held up to the standard of Lisa Price. If you have noticed something different that I didn't catch about the brand, let me know as well down below. Lisa Price still does interviews, marketing, etc., for the brand. I literally see her face everywhere which is a really good thing it shows that l'oreal is keeping their promise to the fans of the brand and the consumers who choose to purchase from the brand carol's daughter can be found in target and ulta it's nice to see that they were able to sustain relationships with these retailers they also can be found in bath and body works online if you are interested in buying body products from the brand they are only sold on their main website. I have ordered from the main website before, not the body products, but just a couple of products in general. And shipping is rather speedy, but then again, I live in the US, so I think shipping and the way they're handling the website is pretty good as well. In conclusion, I look forward to seeing the brand grow. I hope and pray that Lisa Price's influence and her dreams and expectations for the brand continues to mold how the brand works. I sometimes fear if she gets older or she no longer has a hand-on approach with the brand, then L'Oreal will kind of just do whatever they want to do with the brand. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully they stick to their promises. They continue to let the family of Lisa Price and her children have an influence over the brand. And I hope to continue to see growth and better things happen with Carol's daughter. So let me know what you guys thought about this story. Did you guys like this expose and going into depth and details of this company? Would you guys like me to do this for any other natural hair company? Let me know down below. And as always, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time on Dynamic Touch.